This is the postgraduate pediatric orthopedic video series and I'm Nabila Khan working as a pediatric orthopedic specialist. I'm going to be talking about pediatric th- trigger thumb and its release. This is in the chapter 16 of the postgraduate pediatric orthopedics book. Pediatric trigger thumb is not a very uncommon condition. It is seen in about 3 in 1000 children. 25% of the deformity is bilateral and less than 50% of them improve naturally. In this paper we can see that the ones who improve naturally the deformity is either less than 30 degrees of flexion or it's not a fixed deformity. And in this paper by Guhayon Beek it was shown that 76% improved naturally and over a period of 49 months that is 4 years and there were no residual deformities that resolved beyond 48 months. The treatment can be broadly classified as stretching, splinting and surgical treatment that is the release of the A1 pulley. Stretching which is beautifully described in this paper where the metacarpophalangeal joint held in extension these exercises are done about 10 times a day which are taught to the mother and it has to be done both in flexion and in extension. This study also classified the pediatric thumb into four stages. where the stage 0 is normal stage 1 is locking in flexion or extension with active movement with triggering 2 is locking in flexion or extension passive movement with the triggering and 3 is locking in flexion or extension and it was found that 80% of them improved in the stage 1 and 2 by stretching and about 20% improved in stage 3 the next method is the sp- splinting splinting is the extension splinting method for trigger thumb which is beautifully given in this paper and it it in this study it was seen that about 31 thumbs were splinted and about 31 were observed and the splint maintains the interphalangeal joint in hyperextension and prevents the metacarpophalangeal joint from hyperextension splinting is usually done full time for 6 to 12 weeks after explaining the mom how to reduce the jaw, trigger thumb and then night splint is used and it can be broadly classified as three types cured where the full range of motion occurs without snapping improved is where the full range of motion occurs with occasional snapping and non improved when there is persistent or recurrent flexion contracture so there were about 12 children which were fully cured in the splinted group and about four in the observed group so it giving us a good idea that splinting definitely helped and cured in about 12 children and then lastly we have the surgical treatment which is the release of the a1 pulley and it was found that it had a very good outcome with just 4% of recurrence rate the pulley system in the thumb can be broadly classified as to two, as two pulleys a1 and a2 pulleys where the uh, oblique pulley goes goes in between the a1 and the a2 pulley sometimes some children have the av pulley this is a variable pulley and it can be present between the a1 and the oblique pulley usually the release is done from the radial side to avoid damage to the oblique pulley This is our case this is a 26 month old child with fixed trigger thumb deformity with a nota nodule and did not resolve with conservative management Trigger thumb release is done typically in the operating room under general anesthesia the child is positioned supine with an arm table with an arm table on the side and a Well, tunica is applied and inflated 1 cm incision transverse is made over the MCP flexion crease and the soft tissue is dissected there is a layer of fat beneath the skin uh, the skin incision is kept very superficial not to injure the digital nerves beneath it here you can see there is a layer of fat which is being dissected carefully we have to take our time to dissect this as we can injure as we can injure the digital nerves This is probably the most important step of the surgery where we need to identify the new, the A1 pulley without damaging the neurovascular structures. So take your time and use a blunt dissection. Take take the A1 pulley from the neurovascular structure. The A1 pulley is the white glistening structure. You need to identify the proximal and the distal part of it. 
Regarding identifying the neurovascular structures or not, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is to stay in the center and do not uh, see them. And the other school of thought is to identify and protect them. We prefer to identify and protect them so that we are absolutely sure that we do not damage them. As you can see here, I'm taking my time to identify the A1 pulley fully. And I have reached the most important part here. You can see my forceps just at the lower part of the A1 pulley as if I'm going underneath the pulley and alongside the tendon. I'm just getting my retractor to show it better. Here is a small retractor just pulling everything away from the pulley. This is a close-up picture where you can see a red arrow pointing at the lower end of the pulley and you can see the tendon underneath it. Once I identify my A1 pulley, both proximally and distally, I go inside it. I use the blade in a way pointing upwards to avoid damaging the tendon. I start from the proximal end and I will go distally to incise the A1 pulley fully and I keep it as lateral as possible to avoid damaging the annular ligament. As you can see it clearly in this video clip. Once I'm happy with that I have fully divided the A1 pulley, I will test the tendon. I will pass a mosquito and deliver the tendon outside and I will ensure that I deliver the tendon alone and not the neurovascular structures. I will check the tendon sliding easily and I will look closely at the tendon if th to see if there is any damage to the tendon and if any you can repair it at this stage or trim it but this is really rare. Here you can see the fully divided A1 pulley pointed by the red arrow. Once I am happy, I will deflate the tunique and I will prepare myself uh, to stop any bleeding using diathermy. Luckily, this patient did not have any bleeding and I went for the skin closure. Here, we usually use two or three absorbable interrupted sutures. Uh, as, you, as we know that removing sutures is not the easiest task in children. And the most important thing is not to take the neurovascular structures along with the sutures. Make sure your sutures are very superficial and not deep. Then my next step is to inject local anesthesia. As you can see here, the local anesthesia is away from the wound, but I make sure that I fully infiltrate around the wound. And then I apply some steri strips and dressing over it like Mepilex or anything similar. Then I use soft roll and crepe bandage to finish the dressing. And this brings us to the end of our video. I hope you find it useful for your exam and clinical practice.